Now, supposing that instead of going to live in some crummy bedsit in pot noodle land, so you can have the privilege of listening to a burned out hack give the same lecture he's been delivering for the last 20 years, suppose instead of that you could stay at home and hear some of the best lecturers in the world. The idea of MOOCs, massive open online courses, seems to some to promise a new future for higher education, an alternative to an expensive traditional one. We're going to try out the idea out on the university's minister in a moment or two, but first David Grossman reports. Not to be confused with a MOOC, a MOG or a MOOG, what's getting some educationists really excited is the MOOC. It stands for Massive Open Online Course and it shows every sign of really being quite big. Actually, even bigger than that. I think MOOCs has a huge potential. Um, the technology that enables one professor to teach not just 100 students, but 100,000, that really changes the economics of higher education. So what is a MOOC? Well, it's a sort of parceled up bit of education. Enrollment is unlimited, hence massive. There are no entry requirements, so it's open. It's online and, well, it's a course, so course. At the moment, the big players in the MOOC world are in the United States. On the East Coast, there's Harvard and MIT. On the West Coast, Stanford University. But this isn't about geography. The point is anyone, anywhere in the world with a computer can have access to the best courses from the best professors, all for free. For example, I could do a MOOC studying the science of cooking, or, or what about competitive strategy, or, or Roman architecture perhaps, or maybe a spot of differential equations in action. Come to think of it, not a bad place to start would be the machine learning MOOC from Stanford University, because the professor who teaches that is kind of one of the godfathers of MOOCs. About two years ago, I put one of my classes online and it reached an audience of 100,000 students. To put that number in context, I used to teach 400 students a year at Stanford. That means that to reach a comparable size audience, I would have had to teach at Stanford for you know, 250 years. Um, following that, I got together with one of my friends, Daphne Collar, and we decided to start Coursera to take the technology that my team had developed and to partner with top universities so that anyone in the world can learn from the best professors at best universities. The MOOC, though, isn't simply a one-way exercise. There are assessments and assignments and, and quizzes all online. It seems a short step to go from that to real-world qualifications obtained entirely through MOOCs. Already we are told that some employers are looking favourably on those candidates that present themselves MOOCed up. The certificate by itself isn't what's giving them the job, but it is certainly opening the door to more interviews. Because when employers see that you know, you've taken advanced classes from Princeton or Caltech or Stanford, um, that means a lot and it actually opens the door to more interviews. So far, Britain has rather lagged behind when it comes to the world of MOOCs, which well, it's a bit of a shame really, given our glorious and proud tradition of distance learning, as exemplified by the Open University. If you fell asleep in front of the TV during the 70s, chances are you woke up at 2 a.m. to see something like this. The way in which we define rate of change, indeed the way in which we calculate it, but we can get an idea of what's going on. Now the people who brought you that are teaming up with 21 other universities to launch FutureLearn, a British MOOC initiative. They plan to go live in the autumn. This is not, they say, about replacing the traditional university education, but instead widening access. This isn't just a redistribution of traditional education. This is about trying to use a connected environment of the web to deliver something different, to reinvent learning in some way. And trying to bring that to life using the new uh, online social networking tools uh, that are now available to us uh, to really do something different, something fresh. Uh, and critically, to make sure that we're not just pumping out information, but that people are actually learning through what they're doing. One interesting feature about MOOCs is that in the United States, where they're most advanced, well, they're being led by the biggest names in higher education, places like Harvard and Yale. Whilst here in Britain, some of our biggest names are holding back. Here at Oxford, they say that MOOCs won't prompt them to change anything that they do. Is this clever brand management, or could they miss the boat? Oxford delivers degrees in a way which really sets a premium on the, the tutorial experience 
and the teaching on a one-to-one -one or two-to-one basis. Other universities already deliver a lot of their courses, primarily through lectures. MOOCs are a further extension of that. But you have to accept, I think, how, you know, however exciting the concept of the MOOC is, that there is necessarily some loss when you're not in a person-to-person -person environment. The MOOC, from my perspective, can never really substitute for that. People are giving this stuff away for free, so who could have a problem with that? Except, what if this is the big disruptive technology that's about to rip through higher education in the way that MP3s did through music or the Amazon did through book selling? There are certainly some big thinkers who, who believe that the cost of higher education is going to have to come down and MOOCs are one way to achieve that. Recently, Bill Clinton said, I think the only sustainable answer is to find a less expensive delivery system. We simply can't continue to have the cost of a university education go up at twice the rate of inflation every decade. In the United States, the California State Universities are experimenting using MOOCs to replace some of their courses. For example, San Jose University was to offer a MOOC by the eminent Harvard professor Michael Sandel on justice. Except the San Jose philosophy faculty said, no way, Jose. Of course, being philosophers, they used a lot more words than that. In fact, they wrote an open letter to Professor Sandel at Harvard. Professors who care about public education, they wrote, should not produce products that will replace professors, dismantle departments, and provide a diminished education for students at public universities. If MOOCs do take hold, well, there are plenty of implications to consider. Will we need as many universities in the future? Will we need as many academics? And can people do their university degrees without ever leaving home? In Britain and other places where the cost of higher education is a huge political issue, this could be the route to lower costs. But if so, at what cost? Generally, when the internet hits an industry, it tends to find basic inefficiencies in it and enable a better delivery of some of those aspects. Um, I am sure that a combination of uh, online delivery and campus delivery can deliver some aspects of education uh, more cheaply than purely a campus-based uh, experience. Uh, but I think the primary opportunity of MOOCs really is to, is to just broaden access to a whole range of people who otherwise would never have had access to um, these courses. Talk to people who are enthusiastic about MOOCs and they'll say that any institution not getting involved right now is suicidally short-sighted. In fact, you don't have to talk to them for very long before various flightless birds get referenced. I think there is a real danger, if we're doing animal metaphors here, I think there's a real danger of a lemming-like rush, if I can mix my metaphors, onto a bandwagon. Let's, you know, we must do MOOCs because everybody else is. Well, I, I think if you're confident in, in the product that you have, you don't rush to join everybody else. You keep an eye on what's happening, and if you want to develop your own version, you do so in your own time and on your own terms. No one can say where MOOCs will lead, nor indeed where the money is going to come from. Most MOOC providers are commercial ventures, and yet, what's the business plan? I think what we can probably safely say is that their prospects depend on whether they improve the prospects of people who take MOOCs. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'll get back to my machine learning MOOC at Stanford. One great advantage of this way of learning, none of the restrictions of the past apply. This is a collection of um, responses regarding what content different people would most like to see, and are you eating? I hope you have enough for everyone. There's a hundred thousand of us here. <laughs> well, the universities and science minister, David Willits, is uh, with us now. Can you ever see MOOCs replacing universities? I can't see them completely replacing the traditional university, but I do think they're a big thing. I think they're a significant change in education. Uh... So what, they somehow augment the university experience or what? Well, I think what we can see them doing, first of all, in developing countries that do not yet have a network of bricks and mortar universities and have great ambitions for rapid growth, this might be how they help to deliver increased higher education there. And secondly, I do think in our universities they will change the analysis 
of education, how we learn. So when you're on a MOOC, you're doing a maths MOOC, they will identify, you know, 30% of our students made this mistake at this stage of the maths course. They then had to retreat. There'll be a, the education analytics, how we learn, where we make mistakes, how you help people correct those mistakes, will be massively improved as a result of MOOCs. But you, I mean, you, I mean, you, you were at Christchurch at Oxford, one of the finest universities in mm -hmm. the world, m some of the most beautiful buildings. You wouldn't really rather have been at home looking at a screen, would you? No, and I think one of the things that MOOCs will do is, in the language of, sort of the arrival of the web in these services, they will disintermediate. So what will happen is Oxford and other leading British universities will be able to recruit around the world from people who start by doing a MOOC, and they use the fact that someone in Mongolia who does well in the physics MOOC to spot the fact there is talent out there that they want to recruit for a British university. So I think so it could be good news for our university's recruitment. You're not worried about, uh, as the spokesman for Oxford said, this lemming-like leap onto a bandwagon then? No, I think MOOCs are going to be a very important part of the education landscape. But, I mean, you had David gave the, analysis, the analogy with music. So we've all got Spotify and we're all listening to music online. But last weekend, hundreds of thousands of people went to Glastonbury. They didn't say, I might as well just listen to it on my iPhone. They wanted the actual experience of physically listening to music. So I think we'll have a mixture of online learning and people wanting the physical experience of being in a seminar with fellow students. Do you think there's a danger that less affluent students may see this as a more economic way to get an education? And in that sense, you will have a divide between those who can afford to go to university and those who prefer the cheaper option of doing it online. Well, I think it, it certainly could well be a cheaper, low-cost option. And, of course, you can do things like combine it with working. You could do the MOOC in the evenings. And that's a legitimate choice for sure. people to make. But, of course, students who go to university, they're not, you know, they're not paying up front. So it'll be a choice of how people wish to study. And there may be mature students for whom this is a fantastic route for them to get a new set of skills, then change their career. Those things, I think, will be more possible because of MOOCs. But the middle classes are always going to want their children to go to university, aren't they? Well, I think that, that experience of going away to, from home and being with fellow students, yeah, that's, that's why I don't think that those conventional universities are going to disappear. They may teach some of their courses differently. They may be able to recruit more widely because of MOOCs. They may have mature students who learn differently. So it'll be a mix. But MOOCs, I think will be a very big and important part. Are you of the confident that British universities are wised up enough to the commercial importance of this? It certainly, two years ago, when I first came across these on the west coast of the US, they were ahead of us. And I'm very pleased that Open University is now trying to develop FutureLearn, and we have got British universities that are on the main MOOC sites, like Coursera, uh, but if we have got, as I believe we have, a really good British education product, then the arrival of the MOOCs is an opportunity for people around the world to see the quality of British higher education. So I think we can, I think British higher education will probably gain from this. We will have more people around the world who decide, having done the MOOC for the University of Edinburgh, I now want to go and study there. David Pulitz, thank you. Thanks.